Let me introduce our candidates to you right now. To my immediate right, Arden a Anderson, Carl Brewer, Robert Klingenberg, Josh Sfati, and Jim Ward. This will be the one time tonight when you can give our candidates a round of applause, please. If you would, we have a whole lot of ground to cover tonight, so if you keep your applause uh, at non-existent until we end our forum about 87 minutes from now. We're going to begin with one minute opening statements. Arden Anderson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. I'm Dr. Arden Anderson. I'm a family practice doc in Leavenworth as well as I am a flight surgeon in the Air Force. Still, I am a colonel and I am also um, a former educator. I taught vocational agriculture as well as coach track. And I am an international speaker in agriculture, sustainable agriculture and uh, biological farming. And I do and have traveled around the world a number of times. And I'm running for governor because for the bottom line is, is that I've been kind of uh, tired of not being able to get health care reform, not being able to get education turned around, as well as not being able to address the issues in our environment as far as carbon sequestration, as far as um, understanding how that also affects everyone's health from A to Z. Thank you much. Carol Brewer. First of all, let me say thank you for hosting this tonight. I'm Carl Brewer, and I have a lovely wife, Kathy. We've been married for 37 years. I have uh, four children, 13 grandchildren, and uh, was former mayor, two-term mayor for the city of Wichita, largest city in the state of Kansas. Uh, certainly, I've served in the military uh, 21 years. I commanded infantry and armored companies, and I come from corporate America, where I uh, started out as a union steward and a sheet metal mechanic and worked my way up through the ranks. Uh, to become an executive there and just most recently retired and decided that I would get involved about making a difference here in the state of Kansas because I know that we're a great, a great state and, uh, and we need to continue working at it and get ourselves back on track. Robert Klingenberg. Hello, thank you all for being here today. Uh, my name is Robert Klingenberg coming from Salina, Kansas. I am a salesman and truck driver for Frito-Lay. I'm here today because I feel as though the government of the people is not being ran by regular people. I'm here today as a working class candidate to bring some insight from what it's like to be from the quote unquote lower rungs and hopefully bring a fresh opinion and a fresh outlook to the state government. Thank you. Josh Spotty. Good evening, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Josh Waswati. I grew up on a farm in Ellsworth County and I have a farm there now. I'm honored to be joined this evening by my wife Kimberly and our youngest, Kala. All efforts to get my other three kids here uh, proved fruitless. They were not interested in coming. They're down the road at my mother-in-law's house. But it is a pleasure to be here and I think uh, despite it's, the fact that it's fun to be here with the other candidates and the Kansas City Star, I think the reason we're here is because all of you are interested in seeing a change in state government. We have to have a governor that is a fresh and positive face for the state of Kansas that will call for a state auditor and will call for a zero tolerance policy on sexual harassment and will provide the state and the rest of the country an image of what Kansas has always been, a strong and reasonable place and a great place to raise a family. And I am that candidate. Thank you. Jim Ward. Good evening. My name is Jim Ward. I am the leader of the Democrats in the Kansas House. I'm an attorney with two children, Zachary and Emily. Emily's running a little late tonight, but she'll be here. My mom and sister are on the front row to make sure to keep everything online. I started my career as a prosecutor, putting bad guys in jail. I've run a small business for the last 25 years. I've had the privilege of serving on the Wichita City Council, where I fought to put more cops on the street. I've served on the local school board, where we passed the first bond issue in 30 years and improved education for kids across our district. I just won an award from Governing Magazine for building a coalition that reversed the brownback tax experiment. I'm very proud of that. Because I believe in a bright future for Kansas. We just need a strong leader. I'm that leader. Thank you. Let's go to our questions uh, this evening. The first question will go to Carl Brewer. Carl, let's begin with the outgoing governor. Give us your own critique of the brownback administration as he's preparing to leave for uh, Kansas for Washington. What do you think? Well, certainly there's, he's leaving with us uh, there's certainly a financial distract, uh, distraction that we actually have here in the state of Kansas. Uh, he's completely destroyed our economy here inside our communities. Public safety is at an all-time low. 
And, uh, you know, that's not the type of legacy that I would want to leave behind if it were I. I would want it where communities and families and everyone knew that they had government support and individuals there to protect them and to be able to assist them in every possible way. But also had a government where individuals were actually listening to them and providing them with information that they need and assistance. Robert Klingenberg. With Governor Brown back leaving office potentially this year, possibly next year, you know, pending his confirmation in the Senate, I believe when it comes to his legacy, he has left us with a deficit that's going to take many years to repay without proper action. Um, I do not personally fault him for trying what he believed. However, the actual fault, in my opinion, comes from the fact that he willfully ignored facts, data, things that he could have done to prevent further damage. We're, that's what we need to work on as a state. Thank you. Josh Fadi. I had the pleasure of serving in the Kansas legislature for seven years. I moved then to be Secretary of Agriculture in the Parkinson administration. So my time in state government was all either in the Sebelius or Parkinson administration. I was a part of and learned in high functioning government and was proud to be a part of that. And I know that government can work and a coalition of Republicans and Democrats can work. Uh, and I think that's what's really broken down in the last seven years. This is about simply getting together to get things done and provide government services in a way that's efficient, but it serves the people of Kansas. And government can be a whole lot quieter than waking up every morning and watching the news and thinking, my goodness, can it get any worse? I was a part of that for eight years. Uh, and part of why I'm in the race now is because I realized that the state has gotten far worse far faster than I ever thought possible. And we just have to restore what we've always been like as Kansans. Jim Ward. Governor Brownback has been an absentee governor for the last year and a half. He had to go so far as to issue a statement today, if you read it in the paper, that I'm still the governor. And that's the problem in Kansas, okay? I believe that the first day, the culture of the executive branch will change. We will no longer have a secretary of children and family where we lose 77 children. We will no longer have prison riots because we can't pay corrections officers and riots are taking place. Our state hospital will no longer be disenfranchised from the federal government because it's unsafe and we're losing a million dollars a month. That can happen on day one because a governor sets the tone of what it means to work for you, the people, and that who you appoint for the Kansas Corporation Committee, Commission and how we deal with energy and alternative energies. That's what a governor can do, and that's what I'll do as your governor. Harden Anderson. I think the condition at the present time kind of speaks for itself. Brownback went in with a billion dollar surplus, and now we had nearly a billion dollar deficit. And so that kind of speaks for itself. What we really need to understand is that the whole country has a lot of problems right now at every branch. And part of that process really has to go back and actually address some of the major issues we have one is health care. And until we do something about health care, we're not really going to solve a lot of the other problems because that starts with the poor as well as our disabled people in the state. The next thing is, is that then we have to do something about education. But we can't do anything about education until we actually address what the Constitution says is supposed to be addressed. So that's supposed to be the next session, regardless who is the governor. Thank you. Our second question will start with Robert Klingenberg. Uh, Robert, in recent days, Chris Kobach, the Secretary of State and Republican gubernatorial candidate, described what he called a culture of corruption in Kansas. One example he said was the lack of recorded votes in committees. Does Kobach have a point on this issue? Chris Kobach has a decent point on the issue. Uh, the issue of government secrecy and lack of votes, lack of participation has just been a growing problem in the state. A truly transparent government that people understand knowing how it operates, that's how you can prevent things like that from happening with proper oversight and making sure that people are informed, and by people I mean general people, whose actions are causing what issues to arise. Thank jo you. Josh Swati, does Kobach have a point? Yes, as governor, of course, you cannot immediately control the legislative branch, but on day one as governor, I would encourage the legislature to take a number of steps to make the process more open and transparent. 
I think that it's important for the general public to know how committee votes go. I also think that it's important for committee chairmen to give ample time for members of the public to know that a committee hearing is going to be on a topic that they care about. Right now, it's hard. They are sometimes 24 or 48 hours notice, and it's almost impossible for a member of the general public to actually be able to get testimony provided to the secretary of that committee and be able to go to Topeka and, and share their mind. And that's the whole point of the legislative process. It ought to be open. It ought to be available for us to take part. This is the people's process. Uh, and it should be available to the people. And part of that is knowing how legislators vote on committee votes because they are critical votes. I can remember recording my votes sometimes when I was in committee because I knew how important they were. Thank you. Jim Ward? I will not be lectured to about ethics from a man who has been found by two courts to have misled them and is currently under investigation for fraud. So I don't need to take any lessons from Chris Kobach about open government. Second, I've Applause already tried to change the rules, all right? I tried to get rid of anonymous bills. I got a bill passed that says you can't use your private cell phone to do public business. I fought to have recorded votes on committees. And there's no more if I'm governor, and I can't control the legislature, but I can tell them what I'll pass, sign and pass. And that's gut and go bills in committee where you don't know the bill's going to come up and they run it by in the dark at night and things like due process get eliminated. That's not how democracy works and we can change that culture. Thank you. Arden Anderson? I think that it's really sad that here we are in 2017 <clears throat> and we are even discussing such a topic of whether or not the public has access to what our legislatures, who we pay to go and work for us, are doing. It's not just a problem in Kansas, it's a problem in our federal government, it's a problem in many of our states. And it's something that has to change basically from a culture of getting new people into the governmental places of offices, whether it's governor, whether it's legislators, and changing that process where people are informed because they are entitled to be f informed and executing the law so that they do become informed. Carl Brewer? Well, certainly there's some, some serious problems in Topeka today and have been in the past. If you start looking at what's been going on and what's been happening in the state of Kansas for many years, transparency is one of the things that has been limited. I mean, most often we have no idea how individuals and how the individuals that we have, that we have elected to go in and vote for us decisions that they make, bills that they've actually changed where originally it may be this bill today and then next week you're looking at it and it's something totally different It's going to completely get it. The thing is, is you can't have enough transparency and that means transparency for every single citizen to be able to see it. When I was mayor of the city of Wichita and also on the city council, that was one of the things that we did. The voice votes or the paper votes got rid of them where individuals could physically see when individuals either voted yes, no, or they, weren't, or they had to abstain for a particular reason. And it had to be public record as to why they did it, and it was a record if you want to go back and look at it later. Yeah, I want to stay with the STARS series that we just published on Secretive Kansas for a moment, and Josh's question comes to you first. I'm wondering a couple of things. What disturbed you most about the reports that STAR published? And secondly, what as governor would you do to change that culture? I was disturbed about the legislative process, but again, as, as we've said, there's not a lot that the governor can do, except the governor does set the tone for that culture. However, the other story that I thought was most compelling is that within the state agencies uh, and the actions that have happened, and I know having run a state agency, how important it is to set that tone with your agency head. You know, the governor appoints these individuals, and you have to make sure that you are saying this position belongs to the people. Uh, and you are entrusted with uh, the authority to carry out the people's wishes, and that means being accountable to the people. And we do know we've got a disaster at the Department of Children and Families, but frankly, if you begin looking below the surface, there are contracts and movements going on in state agencies that all have to be heavily observed. Frankly, it was one of the reasons I'm supportive of a state auditor. It is, it is absolutely imperative for the state of Kansas to regain the trust of the people that we are operating in an open fashion. Jim Ward. Without a doubt, 
It was the section in the articles that talked about the Department of Children and Family, those people responsible for our most vulnerable children, where they were advising social workers to go against their professional ethics and not make notes and destroy notes and not communicate problems in the agency. Now this is an agency where at least five children have been killed either in custody or DCF has had number of notices that the child's in danger. That was the most disturbing. And I think it's interesting that um, Secretary Kobach has just discovered transparency about a week or after he declared for office. He's been in Topeka for seven years and I've never heard his voice once on any of these issues and you can check the record. I've been there for years. Arden Anderson. The one that really disturbs me the most is the Children's Agency um, issue and the ethics problem with that. I see children, a lot of Medicaid children, on a regular basis. And the problem that I do see, along with a number of parents that have adopted or have taken in children as foster uh, parents, that there is a significant problem that they tell me in getting information back and forth or finding out about children appropriately or getting the information about the parents that need to be um, gotten through in order to protect these children. And the agencies have to give us information. And one of the problems right now is this possibility of this new CJ disease, uh, the Jakob, uh, Jick, uh, Kreitzfeld Jakob's disease. And the uh, Department of Public Health has uh, closed all of the files on that. Carl Brewer. Well, certainly I'm, ter I'm terribly disturbed over uh, the non-transparency and information that's actually going on out there. You know, our children, our families are our most prized possession that we have. And we have to treat it that way. And the secrecy in not being able to, to take care of our children in every possible way, whether they are biological children or they're children in our community, they're Kansans, and they're our responsibility to take care of them. And if there's anything that's going wrong with them, we need to know what it is. There is no reason in the state of Kansas that we should have 17 children that were put into foster care and we don't know where they're at. No reason. So we must become passionate, we must create transparency, and we must come up with a system where it can be measurable, where individuals know what's going on and what's happening. Robert Klingenberg. The thing that shocked me the most is the Department of Children and Families. That surprised me that something like that would happen in a state where generally it seems family comes first. In my own family, family comes first, and I wouldn't want that to happen to my children. What we need to really focus on is creating an open government, something that people can understand what's happening. And at the same time, the people can audit the state. The people are the ultimate auditors of the state. And if we can get back to that, we can stop failing our children and we'll stop failing the future. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move to a question about the politics of Kansas, and we'll start with Jim Ward on this. Uh, Greg Orman's expected independent bid for governor could significantly change the calculus in this race. Experts tell us that a Democrat can't win if an independent candidate is siphoning off votes. Uh, Jim Ward, what's your path to victory in a three-way race? Well, you must be using the general term of experts, which is somebody who's not in the state, because that's absolutely wrong. A Democrat can win, regardless of whether Greg Orman runs or not. Okay? We're, what's going to win this race is the candidate with the vision for the future, to move us forward, who has an economic vision that grows this economy and creates jobs, that has an idea that makes sure kids can get a good education and stay here in Kansas to grow up, who knows that agriculture um, employs 62,000 families in this state, 13% of our workforce, and about 40% of our economy, and it's hurting right now. Commodities are down. We need, if we have a plan that talks about alternative energy and how we use our wind and solar to supplement traditional sources of energy and don't put false barriers, if we have a plan to make college more affordable, we're going to win whoever the Republicans put up or whoever Rouse runs for office. Greg Orman's just a lot of smoke. Arden Anderson, thoughts? Well, obviously we're in a, a state where anybody can run if they so choose to. The bottom line is, is that the public is interested in some results. The public is actually interested in a candidate that actually has hands-on experience in those things that are most critical. Right now, healthcare is. And we hear about people saying, oh, we need to expand Medicaid, 
This country has the most inefficient healthcare system in the world. We spend more than any other country in the world, two to three times many other countries. So first we have to overhaul the system within the budget that we have. We can cut it in half. Cut per person, 8,700 to 4,300 is what we could cut in half if we simply looked at what goes on in Australia, in Canada, and the other countries that have a dual system, a part of the system and a public system. That's where we start. That's how we start getting jobs into the country and into the state, and that's how we start helping people from the bottom up. Carl Brewer. Well, I'm not exactly sure where he received his information from, but what I will tell you is as I've traveled across the state of Kansas, even during my tenure as mayor and coming from the largest city, what people want, they want government to be able to listen to them and be able to have an opportunity to have a voice and be able to express that voice. And they have an opportunity to be at the table. So individuals, they want jobs. They want health care. They want to be able to define what their future is going to be without anyone taking that from them. And it has nothing to do with whether Greg Orman is in the race or not. What it is, it's about is individuals willing to provide in the citizens with leadership, someone to provide them with a vision. I did a lot of that when I was the mayor of the city of Wichita. And when it was my job in the worst recession in the history of this country, I knew that it was my job to go and to bring new businesses and to bring new jobs and to take care of the communities and families in my community. And it's gonna take a governor that's willing to provide leadership with the legislation to be able to do that. Robert Klingenberg. Democrats can win in this state. We know that. 50% of the previous governors in the state of Kansas have been Democrats. People will choose the candidate they can relate to the most. We have seen many candidates fielded, specifically people like Bernie Sanders, Barack Obama for president, that people can relate to. They get excited for that. That's what people will vote for. With Greg Orman joining the race, I welcome him. I'm of the personal belief that anybody could be up here answering these questions and running a race. Anybody, anybody in this room, anybody in the state who lives here could be up here and doing that, and I welcome it. Thank you. Josh Schwadi. I do think it is reductive of Kansans to suggest that they robotically choose only the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or this other guy that doesn't have a party. I think that they have always historically chosen the person that they want the most to do this job, and particularly for the case of governor. Uh, and that's why, in the last 60 years at least, we have had 30 years of Republican administrations, 30 years of Democratic administrations, most of which worked really well. But I do think it comes down to as, and as I talk to uh, employers and business owners around the state and I say, what can we do about jobs and workforce? They say it's perception, perception, perception. We are losing out and tax po all the tax policy in the world can't change the perception that the state is sliding backward. And the, the Kansans are looking for a candidate that can embody the future of the state no matter what party that is in. And that's, that's what I offer to them. Arden Anderson, we come to you with this next one. I want to stay with party affiliation with this next question. You know, when Governor uh, Sebelius was uh, in charge, uh, the Republicans controlled both the State House and the State Senate. And as someone who covered uh, the legislature in those years, I can tell you that very little of her agenda got passed. It was a virtual stalemate. Given that, why, given prospects for a stalemate like that, why should Kansans elect a Democratic governor, and what would be your strategy for working with what's likely to be Republican majorities in both the House and the Senate? First of all, she started with a significant deficit, and even though she didn't have a lot of help, she was able to bring that back to pretty well neutral. So she was able to get some things done. And the bottom line is, is that what Kansans are looking for are, is someone who actually has hands-on experience in those issues that we need to address. And health care is not a Democrat or Republican or an independent issue. It is everyone's issue. And I know how to actually make it happen. I have that personal experience. I have the international experience. It was one of the things that I was commissioned to do a couple of years ago as an Air Force Colonel is to look at foreign health care systems. I know how to make it happen. The next thing is education. I've written lesson plans. I've been in the classroom. I know what needs to happen in order to 
improve our education. That's what Kansans are looking for, regardless. Carl Brewer. Well, certainly uh, Governor Sebelius um, had some challenges when she first came in. But when she left office, we were in the black. And the disaster that we have that's going on started here six years ago. The thing is, is that, you know, I look at one of the things that I come, I came from uh, Wichita, and certainly there were only two Democrats on the council. And the thing is, is bringing everybody to the table, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, and getting them to focus on what's happening to individuals in our families, in our homes, in our neighborhood. What are the needs of those individuals? And once you start bringing them to the table and you sit them down and you say, okay, put aside these other things and let's just focus on Mr. and Mrs. Jones or little Billy or little Mary. Focus on them. And they were able to come together and come to an agreement that these are the things that we need to focus on. But you know, the thing is, is that being a former mayor, that's one of the things that allows you the opportunity to be able to do that, is you get on the ground floor of what's happening in families and homes. Robert Klingenberg, how do you move the ball as a Democratic governor in a Republican state? <clears throat> I think it all involves being able to hold a conversation with the other party. To be able to find that common ground and figure out where you can compromise and take that next step forward. Change doesn't happen immediately. I like to use the metaphor, if you're driving down the highway and realize you missed your exit, try taking a U-turn at 80 miles an hour. It's not going to work. When it comes to party affiliation, I personally believe that the universe is set to a bell curve. The vast majority of people actually lie relatively in the middle. They're willing to work. And if they're not, you have to be able to convince them with facts reason, logic, and try to get things done, things that benefit actual people. Thank you. Josh Svati. I would actually argue that we were very successful during the Sebelius administration. We were able to give hundreds of millions of dollars more to public education. We were able to create and sustain a long-term transportation plan. We were able to expand in-state tuition to children of undocumented immigrants. We were able to achieve a lot of policy milestones uh, by working together with Republicans. And what I can offer that no other Democratic candidate can offer is the experience of representing one of the more Republican districts in the state of Kansas. And that affects the type of legislator that you are, it, it affects the type of candidate that you are, because I come hardwired with the interest of speaking in a way that draws people together. And I think that that's what Kansans want right now. They, they're tired, they're not just tired, they're exhausted by Washington politics, and they're exhausted by Kansas politics, and they really just want things to work well. And we had trouble, uh, external trouble, put on us in, as Kansans, but we weathered through that in this of those years because we were working together. Jim Ward. I, too, want to push back on the premise of the question, Steve. Kathleen Sebelius was an incredibly successful governor. The last time we had a constitutional school finance formula, it was passed under her leadership. We passed CHIP for thousands of children in this state because of her leadership, something that's at risk. We had reasonable budgets that balanced and had surpluses. We pursued alternative energy. And I think there is lessons to be learned from Governor Sebelius to work with. Understand that this is going to shock you. All Democrats don't think alike. All Republicans don't think alike, and it isn't as easy as bringing them in a room and saying, okay, why can't we all get along? you got to work through the difficult minutia of policy and get it done. And we all know today that anybody can't do it because we have a president who is challenged and able to do things. We know it takes someone with the experience to know how it works and the commitment and passion to make the changes this state needs. I want to turn to a different question, your priorities in office. Carl Brewer, I'll begin with you. What three things need to happen in a Carl Brewer administration for you to declare your administration a success? And be as specific as you can. Three priorities. Three priorities. The first thing that I would actually do is immediately create transparency and accountability. Create that so that everyone has an opportunity to see what's going on, what's happening and to take that skill set that I have actually had, that I've learned over the years as mayor and then also as uh, serving in the military in corporate America, the executive for Spirit Aero System, take that experience and that knowledge and put that in place. Next thing that I would actually do is create a zero tolerance sexual harassment policy with 
independent access where individuals can go outside the Capitol and they can actually file their complaint and the, the issues will be addressed. None of our children that are going there, being interns or working there, or any employee or any legislator should have to be, should have to accept something like that. So that is un unacceptable. And then the third thing that I would do is do a complete 100% audit so that you know where your money is at and what you have invested in. Those dollars as, that we have that are actually there in the project, those are your tax dollars. And it's your responsibility. You should know that just the same way you know what's going on in your personal home. Robert Klingenberg. <clears throat> the three things that I would need to be accomplished in order to feel successful. Number one, get the state's finances under control. A state that has no money cannot reinvest <clears throat> into its people for the future. Uh, the second thing I would do, and this is something I definitely want to do, is visit each department of the government. Meet the people that are currently, air quotes, running those departments see where the changes need to be. The people on the ground level will tell you the problems if you're willing to listen. Thirdly, we, at the end of the term, I'd like to see policies implemented for the future. Things like directing the universities to focus on programs for growing industries to create a skilled workforce so that we can leave the state in a much better place than when we started. Josh Fadi. One, clean up the mess. Absolutely appoint state agency heads who are Kansans who understand the problems and can fix them. Appoint or create a position of a state auditor that can look at everything and make sure that we clean it up and clean up all that was associated that Mayor Brewers talked about so well. Two, create an environment where businesses can succeed and thrive. And that includes celebrating the natural resource economy that Kansas has been built on for 150 years. It means investing in higher education and technical education so that we have a workforce of the future. And it means creating the perception, both inward and outward, that we are a great place for young people to come and build a family. And number three, and what I offer special to this race, I worked at a place called the Land Institute. I come from the land. I am acutely interested in the long-term environmental health of the state of Kansas. I have devoted my career to the Ogallala Aquifer and water issues. Governors in the past have paid some lip service to it, but I am dedicated to making sure we're focused long-term on the environment of the state. Jim Ward. I have four. Expand the economy and create new jobs. Good schools for every kid. Health care. You should be able to go to the doctor when you're sick and we'll expand Medicaid immediately when I'm the governor of this state. And we need infrastructure. We need to build good roads and highways. It's smart business. Now you say, how do you do the economy? It's a difficult thing, but first of all, you have to re-establish trust with your partners, which are the businesses across this state. They do not like radical experiments in any shape or form. When you're going to invest money in Kansas, you want to know your state government's a stable partner. They want, I, too often when I talk, businesses are saying I'm looking for qualified employees. And too many kids say they're looking for good jobs. I believe a strong governor can be the, the connector between that. That's going to take job training, investment, and not just four-year colleges, but in technical education and community colleges. We can do that. Arden Anderson. First of all is health care. And right now we're behind the eight ball relative to finances. So if we think that we're going to increase Medicaid in the most inefficient health care system in the world, you're fooling yourself. We have $3.3 billion right now in the Medicaid fund. We can double the number of people in that fund if we appropriately manage the funds and turn it over, similar to what many other countries have done. I already know how to do that. We also have to include mental health care in that process because that is the link or the issue that addresses our prison problem from its inception. Number two, an education system where teachers are getting paid the percentage that they should be. Our percentage right now continues to increase but less and less goes to the classroom because of a lot of regulations coming both federal and state. And the third thing is, is that we need to address all of the issues relative to the environment and actually sequester carbon, not just talk about alternative energy things. 
Thank you. Uh, so before tonight's forum, we asked members of the audience to submit questions, and we wanted to give you a chance to answer a few questions from the audience. So uh, we'll uh, start with a question for Robert Klingenberg, and this question comes from Justin Smith. I don't, Justin, if you want to put up a hand. Hi, Justin. Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, so Robert, as governor, you would have broad power to change how gun rights are currently regulated on state-owned property. What would you change? I personally am a gun enthusiast. I enjoy the sporting <laughs> aspect of it. Um, guns on state property, we definitely need to have a conversation about it and determine whether or not they need to be there. As of right now, I really wouldn't change a whole lot without getting all the facts I would need to make an appropriate decision. Josh Twatty, changes? I think all Kansans can agree that there are certain places where guns should not be allowed and that should be within the purview of the governor and the legislative process. I think we all agree as the legislature and even the governor this last session agreed, guns should not be in mental health hospitals. I think we should all agree that guns should not be in public schools and I think that that is a fundamental and important conversation that we have and it is important for the governor to be willing to have that conversation. Guns are a part of the culture of Kansas, that's fine, but it's also important, like any other element of state government, to put limitations on them and to have that conversation and not be afraid of having it. And I am more than willing to go there. Jim Ward. Thank you. I believe in the Kansas heritage of guns for hunting, for public safety, and for collection. But I think there are places they don't belong. And not only have I said that, I voted that. I voted against putting guns in college campuses. I voted against having guns in mental health. I'm telling you, 33 people in Kansas House Representatives think it's okay to take a gun into a mental hospital. I think background checks are a good idea. I think we should make sure that violent people have a harder time challenges to get firearms. That doesn't disrespect the Second Amendment. It's common sense safety and I support it as a legislator, and I will pursue it as a governor. Arden Anderson? I think that we definitely have to address the issue of appropriate ownership of guns. As a flight surgeon, I sign off on all of our security forces, whether or not they're allowed to carry, based upon whether or not they have mental illness, whether or not they're on medications. And I think that is one thing that we need to address People who are on mental health medication should not be carrying a gun. That's the policy of the military and those people are trained. So why should we allow people who are not trained on mental health medications to carry a gun, number one. Number two, I'm also a gun enthusiast. I do um, uh, own guns and I have hunted. So I understand that heritage. At the same time, I'm not carrying. And I don't think in public places, unless you have security, you should not carry guns without some type of control. Carl Brewer? Well, first of all, you know, I'm not against guns. As you know, I'm a, I'm a hunter, an outdoor sportsman. I believe that it's important for us to be able to have those, those, those types of things. But I also served in the military and I commanded infantry. And I was served as mayor of the largest police department and law enforcement agency here in the state of Kansas other than your state troopers in the KBI. And you know, the interesting thing is in the military and also in law enforcement, those individuals had to have training, regular training. And the sad portion is, is not every time they pull the trigger, they hit what they were shooting at. And yes, we had cases where some individuals end up getting hit and they were innocent. The thing is, is that there's a time and there's a place. And in schools is not the time or the place. In public buildings and hospitals is not the time or the place. We have to have some guidelines and some rules of being able to do that. But coming up with a foolproof system that says that, that's connected to very different agencies that says if this person's a bad person, then we should not have this person carrying a weapon or authorize them to carry a weapon. Dave Helling has been uh, flagging questions on Facebook Live as our event proceeds tonight. A question here from Marge. Do you support medical marijuana in Kansas? Josh Fadi, we'll begin with you and make sure I understand it, whether that's a yes or no for an answer. 
<laughs> yes. Uh, I, I concluded a 105 county tour. I'm the only candidate, Republican or Democrat, that did that. Uh, and I was frankly surprised at the level of interest statewide. And I mean every quarter of the state. Uh, I was asked far more than I had anticipated. I think that part of it is an element of new revenue. I think that part of it is the recognition that between Colorado, which has expanded things, and, and Missouri, which is in the process of expanding, we're going to be in the middle of that. Uh, and I think it's part just a general interest, even among very conservative Republicans that may be dealing with long-term health issues and, and they want some relief. I do remind people, this is Kansas, I remind them we have the Women's Christian Temperance Union booth at the State Fair under the grandstand, so we move a little slower than other states sometimes. Uh, but I am supportive and, and would be supportive of it as, as a measure if it came through the legislature. Jim Ward. Yes, I support medical marijuana. We have an opiate addiction crisis that is just a cancer. And if we can divert some of the pain killers to marijuana, we need to take advantage of that. Um, we need to change the way we do our seizure laws. Now you can have your property taken under just suspicion. And we should make probable cause a tool that before they take your property. But I think the idea that we would deny sick people medicine that can make their pain less, that's not right, and we don't need to do that in Kansas. Arden Anderson. Yes, we have medical uh, research that shows that medical marijuana is less of a problem than our opioids. And prohibition didn't work. <laughs> and we have one of the highest arrest and incarceration rates of any developed country in the world. It's ridiculous. Medical marijuana is a tool, that's the whole point, a tool in order to help people get off from opioids. I have to deal with the opioid thing every day. I read a lot of those scripts. I understand that that process isn't working and the medical marijuana process can help us in moving away from that addictive process as well as a revenue process as the previous speakers have mentioned. Carl Brewer. Answer it. Long story short, yes, I support using mar medical marijuana and uh, allowing individuals. If you've had a family member, if you've met individuals, as mayor, certainly we've had that, and I've seen individuals. But one thing, if you know that you can't save their lives, you can at least make it a little more comfortable for everyone and everyone in the family and allow them to be able to enjoy what time they have left with their families, particularly when they start talking about cancer. So I support it, and the, the sooner we do it, the better we'll be. Robert Klingenberg. I would definitely support medical marijuana. Uh, from what I know, we are, as Kansas, one of only a handful of states that doesn't have a medical <coughs> marijuana law. Um, if this is the direction the country is going, absolutely. We should also definitely be having the conversation of what to do when all of our neighboring states modernize or allow recreational, and we should be having that conversation and talk. That's what we should be doing, having conversations, passing facts. Start with medical marijuana, we can work our way up from there. It's unanimous. Uh, okay, thank you for your clarity and yes or no answers. Um, Want to talk about a front burner issue that is school finance. This question goes to Jim Ward first. The Kansas Supreme Court ruled recently that lawmakers failed to adequately fund public education, but the court didn't specify a dollar amount. So for remedying the situation. So how much do you think should be spent and where should that money come from? And please be specific. <laughs> I think that's the wrong end of the question to start with. The purpose of school funding is to ensure our children get a good education that they can compete in a global environment. That's where we should start. What does it take to teach our children the arithmetic, writing, and the skills they're going to need to compete in that international economy? Then we put a price tag on that, and then we find the revenue. Now, the good news is, because of the work we did just a few months ago, revenue has come in much better than we expected, and we have a little bit of cushion. And so we have a lot of tools at our disposal, but I understand for the media particularly, the big question is, where's the money going to come from? I think that's what most Kansans want to know, what are they going to get for that money, and the, what the outcomes of that education are and then pay for it. I am so proud that we were able to give teachers their first pay raise in seven years this year because we spent money 
on schools for the first time. Thank you, Arden Anderson. How much do we need to spend? That's a, a very good question, and I wish that were a black and white answer to that. Part of the problem is, is the formula, and that formula has to do with the differences in school communities. Certain communities have more special needs children than other communities do. Certain communities have a greater need for vocational education than other communities do. And as such, you can't say that one formula fits all or one dollar figure fits all. We have to go to the individual districts and find out from them, have the input from them, what kind of numbers are reasonable, what kind of numbers can we support, and will actually execute the plan as far as allowing those districts to teach the children the way they need to be taught in those individual communities. With that collection of data, we then can come up with a total number and move from there. As far as the funding process, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> okay, we'll try again. Carl Brewer. Education. As you've heard me say, our children are almost our most prized possession. But I believe that education and our children are the driving factor as to whether or not communities grow. From being a former mayor, I have learned that when businesses decide that they want to come to a particular community, to a state, the things that they look at first is, is one, is there a skilled workforce there? <laughs> Two, what's the longevity of that skilled workforce? Secondly, what are the schools like? If they're bad and you don't have it and you're not competitive, they're not coming to your communities. And those good jobs that you're looking for are not going to come there no matter what you offer them because you're not identifying that there's going to be a future. Now we talk about how much is it going to cost. I don't think that anybody really know what it's going to cost. We know that on average we want to make sure that the children all have a fair and equitable opportunity, but as an entire state, we need to look at, we're suiting these children up to go and to challenge the rest of the world competitively and live the same quality of life that you have. And we need to provide them with the best education that you can possibly find and make it a priority. Because if you make it a priority, the economy will grow, businesses will come to you, and not the second. And the second thing is, we'll stop the brain drain. <laughs> Robert Klingenberg, the issue of school finance is a hard one. Um, it's extraordinarily difficult to put an actual dollar amount on what would generate success if you even can. We know that several countries around the world, Finland, Singapore, Hong Kong, well, part of China, anyways, they spend significantly less per student and achieve better results. What I would propose would be to examine the way we're administering education. When you look at Finland, the number one thing they say they do differently than the United States is let the children be children and let the teachers be teachers. The, to me, school finance is really a problem of what are you getting back from that investment? What are we doing? Are we generating a low skill workforce on purpose only to go into higher education and come out debt ridden? These are questions that we definitely need to ask and talk about. And when it comes to financing and paying for it, you got, if we can get the budget under control, that's where we can get the money from. Thank you. Josh Swati. This is tough in a minute, Jim. We could attack each other and each get a minute rebuttal to kind of give some additional time. But uh, uh, I think that it's clear that the, uh, the legislature has underfunded public education in the last seven years, probably in the couple hundred million dollar range. But the challenge of the next governor is that they're going to have to, to weigh and balance the needs of K-12 education, which is huge, with the needs of higher education, with the needs of mental health facilities, with the needs of corrections, uh, with the fact that the legislature and the governor for the last seven years have been robbing the transportation funds uh, and putting a lot of this into bonded indebtedness for our children's future. So there's a lot that has to be accomplished uh, moving forward for the next four years. And I think that any governor is going to have to prepare a plan that is put in place over time because it's going to take time. And the only other addendum I would have to this is that there are a lot of people that say, well, the legislature's got to figure this out. I think one thing that the governor and the legislature need to do is respect the democratic process, which is school boards still run our schools. And if school districts say they need more money, we should uh, trust them and trust what they're asking for. Let's stay with uh, education, and I'm wondering, Arden, if you would begin with this, if you could offer uh, to the audience your vision for public education in the state, including higher education. What's your view? What should it look like? What do you want to see? 
Well, I have four degrees, so higher education is a very important thing to me. My grandfather never made it through the second grade because he couldn't speak English, and my father didn't really learn how to read until after he retired. So education was a very important thing for my parents, for their children. And so public education absolutely, as Carl Brewer said, has to provide children with those skills that they need to go into the workforce. Now, 70% of Kansans don't have an advanced degree. They're high school graduates. Those children need vocational education. I was a VOI teacher. I understand vocational education. The other 30%, we've got to do something about the debt that these come, kids come out with. I can tell you from medical school, I came up with a $300,000 debt. I know what it's like to come out with a debt. We have to address that issue. Thank Carl Brewer. Well, as you heard me say, education is number one priority. And, uh, and we can't invest enough in uh, education for our children and giving them that opportunity to be competitive. But then secondly, you know, as, as the doctor said, you know, we can't forget trade school for various different reasons, whether individuals just can't, just don't have the capability of being able to do it. Not all of them will go on to college. And so that is certainly a challenge and we must create an environment where individuals can actually learn a feasible trade, not just a trade to get them by, a trade that they can actually make a living on. And that was one of the things when I was mayor that we looked at is creating a training school so the individual could go into the aviation industry or they could go into the manufacturing industry since manufacturing is a large percentage of the entire state's budget. It's giving them that opportunity to be able to learn a trade but not have to make it to the higher education and they can still have a decent quality of life. So that's a priority in being able to do that and we're going to have to continue working on it. Robert? <clears throat> My vision for public schools and higher education, I got a lot of points. I'm going to try to sh shoot these off real quick. When it comes to public education, the way we administer education really hasn't changed a lot in probably the past 200 years. It all involves somebody standing up front and passing out information and expecting you to memorize it. All kids do not learn the same. What I envision is a school system where we cater and tailor the needs to each specific child, advancing our best and brightest and helping the ones who need the help. Moving on into higher education where possible in industries that are growing or sciences that are becoming reality, things like CRISPR, advanced biology degrees, regenerative medicine, having people trained and ready in order to accommodate for these growing industries. Another thing I would definitely like to see is pre-K education available in more places across the state, preferably universally. And at the end of everything, I personally believe we can have universal education for everyone. Josh. When our ancestors built the state, one of the very few things that they made sure was in the Constitution was the right of a, of a, a suitable but a world-class public education available to every Kansan. And so it is one of the few things that we ought to commit ourselves to doing really well. And it's not simply money, but it's respecting teachers and giving them due process and giving them uh, the idea that they will have a stable environment in which they will teach so that we have a pipeline of young people that want to enter that profession. And I will do all of those things as governor. As to higher education, it's not simply respecting what it can do for young people to bring them up out of middle class, but it's also respecting institutions of higher education as sources of economic development and pride in these states. And they are hugely important in doing that. And I, for one, am extremely proud of our tradition of higher education in the state of Kansas. I look at the trouble they're having at the University of Missouri and the legacy of segregation that was only broken in 1950 there, and I think I am proud that the University of Kansas was desegregated in 1870, something that all of us should be proud of and we should celebrate. Jim Ward. K-12 first, every child has a fair chance at success. Two, teachers feel respected and valued members of the team. 
technical education is a vital component of job training and it's a good way to make a living. It is as good or better than a four-year education. We need to form partnerships with businesses so they can help design the curriculum with professional educators so that these kids walk out able to go to work on day one and adaptable to the massive changes that hit us every day in this world. And it is absolutely a crime to the debt that our kids are having when they leave colleges today. Did you know in Kansas the second largest cause of death for kids 15 to 29 is suicide? And it's partly because of the stress of the debt they have when they come out of schools and the fear that their life isn't going to be as good as their parents. We are better than that in Kansas and a new governor, Jim Ward, will make sure we are. Thank you. I wanted to talk a little bit more about higher education and specifically how we pay for higher education. And we'll start with you, Carl Brewer. Um, should higher education uh, receive more money to stave off tuition increases, the tuition increases we've seen in recent years? And if so, where should that money come from? And I'll try this again. Be specific where that money should come from. Okay. So should we actually create an environment, bottom line is, where higher education is affordable? If we're not going to provide them with free education, then we certainly shouldn't be continuing to charge them more and more for education. Now, taking it a step farther, when you say, well, where do, where do these dollars come from? So often we create opportunities and opportunities for businesses to grow, major corporations, that, and we give incentives and we give dollars and we let schools give away tax dollars and things of that nature that they can actually use to be operating off of and for jobs that are minimum wage. Go out and recruit good jobs that if you're going to provide those type of incentives, provide that type of opportunity, but then take those additional tax dollars that you actually have from creating those jobs, make individuals pay those dollars, and then you apply that to the schools and give the schools their money back. But then secondly, create an environment where when we start talking about giving incentives for various different businesses, let the schools know this is what the economic impact is going to be and this is how much of your budget and your money that we're going to be giving these corporations, because currently today, we're already giving some corporations <coughs> millions of dollars, and then we turn around and we go back and we give them additional millions of dollars as an incentive to, uh, to not do it as well. Those dollars are dollars and the tax dollars that you yourself have paid into. Robert Klingenberg. I think we should definitely <clears throat> excuse me. I think we should definitely put as much funding towards reducing tuition rate as, as possible. I would pay for this by implementing, number one, a controlled budget and reducing our spending to be, able to be able to shift that money into a college fund, and second, implementing a more progressive tax system that fairly targets individuals who have reaped the benefits of getting tax cuts, what seems to be, every two years, if not faster. By doing that, we are telling them we are coming to collect that which you took from the rest of us. Thank you. Josh Swatty. Tuition stability starts with a governor and a legislature that makes good on their uh, commitments to higher education. Part of the reason that higher education institutions have to turn to tuition increases is because they have been forced through mid-year allotments when the state suddenly realized we don't have the money that we promised to give you, those institutions are then forced to turn to tuition because they have no other way. Our leaders of our region's institutions are smart and they are capable and they can plan if they have a stable state government that they can plan with. But when they are forced to have mid-year allotments where they lose two or three hundred million dollars, that's when we begin to see the tuition problem. And so on day one as governor, I would go meet with the region's institutions and say, how can we plan for the future? And I commit to you, if we tell you at the beginning of a fiscal year, we are going to give you this amount of money, we will commit to providing that amount of money because we know that it's tuition assistance at the end of it and it comes down to those students and we cannot ask any more of them. Jim? One of the best programs the federal government ever done was done under Kansan. It's called the GI Bill of Rights. And it put thousands of men and women who served in World War II through college and created the greatest expansion of the economy in the history of the world. It works. An educated 
electorate, an educated workforce works. In Kansas, we're holding on to that with our fingertips. The federal government has just virtually dropped out as a partner over the last 10 or 15 years. This recent tax experiment that they've taken from Kansas and made it national takes away a lot of tools that families use to pay for college education. We need to push our federal partners to re-energize the GI Bill of Rights for kids today. They deserve no less, and oh by the way, it would be a heck of an economic driver for this country and this state. Arden? I think uh, the program that Josh Swati said, as far as stabilizing our budget, that's, that's really the first thing we have to do with any of the discussions about any of the programs we're talking about at the government. At the same time, we also have to understand socially, one of the problems with college tuition today is that it's become a beauty pageant between colleges, a competition of who can have the bigger buildings and so on, and less and less again is going to the professor and the classroom. So that's not something we're going to solve in the short term. But in funding, Australia has an interesting process where the government pays if they go in state, and then they have an incremental tax payment back once they get above a given income level, maybe another 1% or another 2% that repays their school loans over time. That's just one option. But we have to look at those kinds of things because the federal government, the state governments were all limited on funds. Okay, we have another question from an audience member here, Rebecca Casey. Is she here? Yeah. I'll, try and, I'll try and do her question justice nonetheless. She writes this, given the current environment of the Me Too movement, Time Magazine's person of the year being the silence breakers and the rise of female candidates running for office nationwide, we're facing a gubernatorial race in Kansas, as you may have noticed, with not one female candidate. How are you going to increase the opportunities for women to take leadership roles in Kansas government and encourage young women to pursue leadership careers in male-dominated fields like STEM should you win? Robert Klingenberg, you have the first shot. I strongly believe that the strongest society and strongest governments come from an attitude of diversifying and including multiple viewpoints. If you want to inspire young women to run, reach out to them. Tell them to run. Again, earlier I said anybody in this room could be up here answering these questions. Anybody. That's what we should be focusing on, inspiring a new generation of leaders, going out to schools, talking to them, saying, you can do this. Women are every bit as equal as men. They're, everybody is equal in this state, period. All people are equal. We have to get to that understanding. Thank you. Josh? I think that it's incredibly important for us to make sure that the process is open to everyone. And I had the pleasure and joy of serving in the administration uh, along with some exceptional state agency heads. And I can tell you, diversity works. And even within my own state agency, the Department of Agriculture, we had a senior staff that was split about 50-50 male and female. And it was awesome. And it worked really well. And I think it begins at the top. Uh, the governor has to set that tone. Uh, but I also think that it's important for us as Kansans, who have a wonderful tradition of, of being out ahead of inclusivity uh, than other states around the country, of making sure that that extends well into the 21st century. We need to be leading, and we need to know that this process and this availability is open to everyone uh, that wants to be a part of it. And it does start at the top with the governor's office uh, setting the tone and making sure that it's diversity, not just with gender, uh, but with um, all sorts of, of differences. Jim. It's more than just saying I'm going to do this. It's actually doing it. Three of my four staff members as leader of the Kansas House are women. On my campaign, I have one guy besides myself and the rest are women. Um, it is empowering women with actual authority. And I have an example this year as we went through the budget and the tax discussion, there was a group, primarily of freshmen women, who began meeting 
and having conversations about how they could move the process forward. A less confident leader would have said, oh gosh, that's a danger, that may take away from me. I saw it as essential to moving the process along and allowed that to go forward. I think that's how the, we move forward out of this culture we're in right now, is actually empowering women with jobs that have meaning and opportunity to change the world. Arden? Absolutely, it starts at the top. The culture begins with the leader. And what we have to understand is that we're not the only country that has been dealing with this. Iceland has a law in place that their executive branch, 40 to 60 percent have to be women. So it's mandated. It's, it's not an option. And unfortunately, in a lot of things that we do, we actually have to put mandates in place in order to get things to happen. And so I find that having at least half women in any organization makes it more dynamic. And certainly in the military, where I am as well, the women are absolutely some of our keyest players in that medical squadron. And I know for sure if we had more women involved, we'd probably have fewer wars. Carl Brewer. Well, certainly as we start looking at what's, what's going on, uh, we can talk about how, how women are equal and that we should provide an opportunity, but you have to treat them as equals and respect their views and respect their opinions the exact same way you do with race. People are people and they all have sensitive needs. So the thing is, is create an environment to bring individuals along. When I was mayor, when I was first elected mayor, I had the opportunity to select who's going to complete my term. And I selected a female. And the only thing I wanted from her was to take that, the job that I had had and to make it better. And she did a phenomenal job. And this lady is leaving here within the next three or four weeks because of term limit. Did a phenomenal job in representing communities, representing districts, representing the state of Kansas. And, uh, and many times, no one here even knew that she was actually doing it. So, you know, for those of you that don't know, if you run into a woman by the name of Levanta Williams, I want you to thank her for the wonderful job that she has done in representing Kansas. And not only that, but taking not what I did, but taking it to a whole nother level. Thank you. So we'll switch gears and talk about Medicaid for a minute. And we'll start with Josh Twadi on this question. The state privatized its Medicaid program a few years ago under the leadership of Lieutenant Governor Jeff Collier, soon to be governor, now also a candidate for governor. Was that the right move when it comes to providing health care for the poor? I don't think you can automatically say that privatization of some services is bad. However, again, back to my 105 county tour, the singular takeaway that I heard all across the state, can care is not working. I mean, you have to ask yourself, does it serve its patients in a better fashion? No. Does it provide a timely and adequate reimbursements to those providers? No. Is it more efficient, something else that it promised it would be? No. And so that is a day one priority of my administration. We have to completely overhaul can care and the system that we, uh, by which we provide our neediest citizens care across the state of Kansas. Uh, it has not at all functioned the way it does. And I also think that it's dangerous when you have long-term contracts into the billions of dollars with out-of-state entities. These are dollars that could otherwise be kept in the state of Kansas and frankly serve more people that are currently on waiting lists. And that's a high obligation of mine. Jim Ward. We have to make a distinction between privatization and managed care. Privatization has been a failure. It didn't work in the 60s, which is why we created Medicaid, because there's not a profit model that works for giving poor people health care. Um, managed care can work, and there are ways that we can do managed care. But the goal of the program has to be different than it's been for the last seven years under Collier and Brownback, which is how can we slash the Medicaid budget? These are the most vulnerable people. These are our mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers in nursing homes. These are our children. The biggest group of people who use can care are children and the disability community. I fought hard to keep the disability community out of that system because it wouldn't work, it hasn't worked, and I'm fighting to get them out of it. It's wrong that we have the problems going on with our nursing homes today 
for a lot of reasons. And Star wrote an article this week about um, the opiates being used as the new restraint. We don't have to live in a state where we treat our most vulnerable like that. Arden? It is absolutely a problem. What most people don't understand is that why the other countries systems cost half or less is because they have two distinct systems. They have a public system and they have a private system and they don't mix the two together. We have mixed the two together in an adulterated system called Medicare in the state of Kansas. I have the numbers. We can cut the cost in half per person without any reduction in care. I know the numbers on medicines, on MRIs and radiology and labs, and on the cut that the public or the private system takes out of that. You cut it in half, that means with the current budget, we could extend that to 750,000 people, which means 26% of Kansas, everybody below 36,000 could afford or could have, we could afford to give them care now. Carl Brewer? I don't support privatization. And the reason I don't support the privatization is because there is no accountability. When you privatize it, then it becomes a business. And it's not about the health care that you're actually receiving. It's what that profit margin is for those individuals. And so that's why you have individuals that are setting up in hospitals that are waiting for somebody to come in to either change their sheets or to change their bandages or to give them the necessary help. No. We've got to create an environment where we're going to invest in a health care system where there is some accountability and, you can, and it's measurable accountability. We have to do those types of things. If you start looking at the nursing homes that we have, the number of people that I hear that refuse to let their loved ones or relative go into a nursing home because of fear of them not being taken care of and them not coming back out. So I don't support it. Robert? <clears throat> to me, privatizing something means shoving it to the side, say it's not my problem. I think we need to start talking about health care as it should be. Health care as a system, not an insurance system. They are not the same thing. I do believe that someday in this country we will have universal health care. That should be the end goal of any health care system. The problem with privatization to me, as echoed prior, is the fact that these companies only care about a profit. They don't want to protect people, they want to protect their shareholders the people pumping money back into them to keep doing what they're doing. To share a personal story, I had a doctor visit maybe three weeks ago, and I got the full bill in the mail. What did my insurance do for me? That's not health care. That is delaying the payment of your, of your medical coverage. That's what that is. So it's something that we should definitely be thinking about and working our way towards providing for every citizen in Kansas. Thank you. Josh? I, I think I answered You started. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I panicked for a second, Steve. <laughs> Doing two things at once here, your moderator is. <laughs> Let's do one last question, then we're going to go to closing. Kansas generates about $350 million a year from the sales tax on <clears throat> purchases of food. This question goes to Jim first. The rate of tax, 6.5%, it can go higher with add-ons. What do you make of it? What needs to happen? How high of a priority would it be for you to lower the sales tax on food, Jim? It's appalling and immoral. Because um, most of us in this room, it, it's a pinch, but it doesn't mean we have to choose between whether we'll pay our rent or our utilities or buying food. I've already voted on numerous occasions to cut the sales tax on food. And one of the plans we put forward on tax reform included a reduction on food sales tax. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to have to be gradually phased out. It, co it costs $400 million to eliminate sales tax on food. That doesn't mean we shouldn't begin the long journey of getting rid of it. And as governor, I will try to build budgets that reduce this reliance on food sales tax because it's wrong. Arden? I come from originally the state of Michigan, and they don't tax food. And so it really is appalling because it hurts only the lower income people the most. And I have patients, about a third of my patients are Medicaid and Medicare. They literally have to make a choice between food and medicine. 
So that 6% that raises, or 6.5% that raises their food costs does make a difference to them. Every dollar makes a difference. Yes, we're going to have to move that over to some other system in order to be able to collect that money. Of course we're going to have to do that. But we have to get off the idea that we can tax the lower class into oblivion, which is basically what's happening with well, the current tax plan that just went through, as well as our system here in, in food tax. Carl. I don't support taxing food. And I say this because, you know, as a former mayor, I grew, I grew up, and not only that, but represented a, uh, a low-income, very humble community. And I've seen individuals to include my family, you know, growing up. When you go in and you have to figure out you're going to buy a loaf of bread, but you gotta count the pennies out because you gotta pay the taxes. So we end up going without, in a lot of cases, on some things. The thing is, is that the people that is gonna impact the worst are those that are low income and those that need it, those that have the minimum wage jobs. And not only that, but we have a large number of children that you know for a fact, you can use that as something to measure by, that get meals at schools because mom and dad can't afford to be able to pay that or, or to get that for them. So, I don't support taxes on food, and as governor, I would do everything in my power to find a way and come up with a strategy and a plan, and one that would be measurable where everybody can see what's going on as we're getting closer and closer to not having any food tax. Robert. Uh, I would definitely support the removal of a food tax. Um, it will take time. There are so many budget holes and things that we need to examine and figure out where our money is going in order to achieve that. However, I do believe that it is possible. Um, at one point in time, I do believe Kansas had seven different income tax brackets. We're down to two. We need to re-examine the way that we're collecting revenue across everything. Everything has a tax on it this day and age. We need to look at that and say, okay, what doesn't need to be taxed and what is hurting people? Thank you. Josh? Tax policy is hard. I commend the legislature this last year for taking the actions that they needed to help the state. But anytime you have a discussion of tax policy and it's capable of getting to the necessary votes to pass in the House and Senate, I think you have to have a discussion of lowering the food, uh, sales tax on food. And as governor, the next time we have that discussion, which will probably be very soon, I would make it absolutely a plank of that package. If we're going to talk about taxes or even increasing taxes, it has to also go along with lowering the sales tax on food. And I think one of the things that Johnson Countyans and Kansas Cityans can take pride in is this is a demonstration of people engaged and pushing for action because frankly it was several food nonprofits here in the Johnson County, Wyandotte County area for the past several years, almost seven or eight years ago, that have been saying it's sales tax on food, lower the sales tax on food. And when it started, not a lot of people were talking about it. And now here it is, we're talking about it in most of our forums, and I think we're committed to actually doing something about it. That shows that people can have a difference. We've come to the end. Let's do one minute closing statements. Arden, you have the floor first. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming tonight. I think the issue that we really have to look at is having a governor that actually has hands-on experience in those issues that need to be changed. Because you have to know what questions to ask. You have to know what people to ask if you don't know the answers yourself. And you have to know that whenever you ask somebody, are they telling you the truth? Or are they coming at it with their own opinion because of some lobbyist? I know healthcare. I know it inside and out, and I know how to fix it. I've done that for a number of years. I also know education. I've been in the classroom. I've done the lesson plans. I've taken care of the children. I know what needs to be done. As well, I understand the environmental issue and the public health issues as well as the mental health issues and how they connect with everybody's health, with the economy, as well as how we process all of that into a state government. I'm Dr. Arden Anderson, and I ask for your vote. Carl Brewer. Well, first of all, let me say thank you for giving us an opportunity to come in to, uh, to meet with you and talk with you about uh, the next governor of the state of Kansas. You know, I started looking at, at what's going on, what's happening around the country and also in the state of Kansas, and where do I fit in? And to be able to be a good governor, you're going to have to be a good leader, but you're also going to have to be a good listener. 
and you're going to be prepared to make those tough decisions when tough decisions need to be made. Now, I've had the opportunity to be the mayor of the largest city in the state of Kansas for two consecutive terms. Only two mayors have ever accomplished that. I come from corporate America and have worked to be able to create jobs, new jobs, diversifying the types of jobs, going and exporting our goods outside the country to sell to somebody else so that we could create more jobs here. I served in the military 21 years. When disasters happened in your communities, whether it be in Greensburg or whether it be in Coffeyville, I was the one that was up at night and worrying and concerned about that mayor and that particular community, those families, and thinking to myself, I've got to make sure that they have all the resources they need so that when that sun come up the next day, they know that they will be taken care of. They know that help is there. That's the type of person that you're going to need in leadership. One that has vision, one that's going to take care of you, one that's going to take your family and treat it as if it's his very own. So in doing that, I believe that I'm the right person. I have the executive experience, I have the knowledge, and I've already been there and did that in so many cases. And I would do the exact same thing that I've learned and apply that as the governor of the next of the state of Kansas. All right. Robert. For me, I have saved, if I were governor, I would definitely want to be a governor that listens. Everybody has a viewpoint. Everybody has an opinion. I want to hear those things. I want to see a more diverse government and a more diverse state. I myself am the son of a naturalized U.S. citizen. My family came here in the 70s, and because of that, I would not be standing here today. Or had they not come, I wouldn't be standing here today, excuse me. I believe a victory of mine would show the rest of the country, as well as the world, that government can be run successfully by normal people. A government of the people should be ran by people. Not special interests, not money, but by people who want to do nothing else but help as many people as they possibly can. I'm Robert Klingenberg, and I want to be your governor. Josh Spotty. Uh, several of us went to a pre-Thanksgiving event in Lynn County a few weeks ago, and as I drove in, I drove past the Mine Creek Battlefield. My great-great-grandfather uh, was in the 5th Missouri Cavalry on the Union side and fought at that battlefield, and then after that he came out and drove a freight wagon between Fort Riley and Fort Larned before he settled on the Saline and Ellsworth County line. And my family's been here ever since. I'm the fifth generation. The sixth is over in the door over there. I love this state. I love it. And I'm proud of it. And it's a great state. And we are at a crossroads. And we know that we have to fix what has happened. But as articulate as all of us are, there is no second place in politics. It's about winning. We have to win this race. I have toured all 105 counties, gone through all of them. I come from a very Republican part of the state, and I can do what a Democrat's not been able to do since the Civilian Administration, deliver a victory and begin the process of governing in a stable and reasonable way again. I'm Joshua Swati, and I humbly ask you for your vote. Thank you. Jim Ward. Thank you, Kansas City Star, for giving this opportunity for the people of Kansas to engage their candidates for governor. It is a critical election. Shame on our Republican colleagues for trying to rig the game and avoiding you, the people. Thank you for spending time with us tonight on this busy holiday season in a room that gets pretty hot when we talk for an hour and a half and sticking it out. Thank you very much. I believe there are two tests that you should use to decide who your candidate for governor will be. One, who has the depth of knowledge and the vision for a future Kansas? Jobs, health care, good schools, infrastructure. And second, because we know who our opponent is in this election, who can stand up toe-to-toe -to -toe with Chris Kobach and not give an inch on our values and on what we care about. My name is Jim Ward, and I would appreciate your vote on August 7th. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all the candidates for joining us here tonight. You offered us a lot of interesting insights in one-minute increments. Um, I also want to thank all the Kansas voters who were here in person at the Johnson County Library and everyone who watched from on Facebook Live at home. 
Uh, we hope to continue this conversation in 2018. The STAR will be hosting more candidate forums, so please stay tuned and have a great night.